sowing the seeds of cannabis and sounding the praise of our favorite plant, it's time to Hemp Resent. Our radio resident Hempo Sapien, Vivian McPeak, will present a weekly platform for guests and listeners to Hemp Resent about hemp and cannabis from the legal, activist, and reformist route. Let's round up and roll it up for our headmaster of hemp, Vivian McPeak. Welcome to Hemp Present, the only radio show that is weighed by the ounce and where we fight for fiber freedom and herbal health one interview at a time. It is 420 somewhere, so spark those audio ear holes up. I am your host, Vivian McPeak, but you can call me Grandmaster Stash. I am the executive director of the world's largest annual cannabis policy reform event, the Seattle Hemp Fest, in its 24th year, found at hempfest.org. I am also the author of the book, Protestable, a 20-year retrospective of Seattle Hemp Fest from AHA Publishing. Transmitting from a fortified bunker under a ramshackle reefer radio warren at an undisclosed location deep within the bowels of underground Seattle, my goal is to spread the green flame of 420 truth and create community with impunity while increasing the peace here on Hemp Present on the Cannabis Radio Network. Before cannabis was prohibited in the early 20th century, It was one of the most widely prescribed botanical medicines in the entire pharmacopoeia. Its safety has been supported by the fact that humans have used it therapeutically for thousands of years. Not content with just prohibiting the sale, manufacture, and use of cannabis, the United States government has also prevented scientific research from being conducted on any promising aspects of cannabis for many decades. Despite prohibitionists' restrictions, some science has taken place, albeit primarily via the National Institute on Drug Abuse, where research is limited to harmful effects of the drug on the brain and body. Despite this research bias, there is still a large body of work supporting that cannabis has significant therapeutic potential. Research bias in the United States has prevented many people from receiving the benefits of reduced suffering in untreatable disease, as well as the potential for actual treatment of a wide range of diseases. In America and beyond, there are many children and adults suffering from a host of neurological, autoimmune, and degenerative diseases such as autism spectrum, epilepsies, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Conventional medicine and pharmaceutical products have little to offer these patients. While cannabis has the potential to provide effective treatment and or relief in many cases, this year the American Academy of Neurology said in a new position statement that cannabis may be useful in treating some illnesses of the brain and nervous system and called on the federal government to allow research to happen. Both child and adult athletes often suffer traumatic injuries to the head and brain. Cannabinoids are the only compounds that have been identified as potential neuroprotectant and anti-inflammatory agents. They have shown potential in animal models that mimic traumatic brain injury for preventing further damage and accelerating healing and even growing new brain cells. Yes, you heard that right. An average of 22 U.S. veterans commit suicide each and every day. Cannabis as a whole plant medicine has shown potential in treating post-traumatic stress disorder, pain, Depression are all common disorders that veterans experience after discharge. Soldiers suffering from combat-related injuries all over the world could benefit from cannabis as medicine. A cannabis use survey has revealed that anxiety and depression are third in the list of conditions for which patients self-treat with cannabis in Washington State. In fact, one in ten Americans now takes an antidepressant medication, some of which have shown potential catastrophic side effects. Cannabis is safe and non-toxic and has promise in treating both anxiety and depression without intolerable side effects. America's baby boomers are aging, and groundbreaking research in Israel where scientific study on cannabis is allowed indicates that cannabis has great promise in the treatment of dementia. Israel's Ministry of Health licensed 10,000 patients to use cannabis medicinally and has sanctioned more than a dozen studies to treat dementia as well as illnesses like Crohn's disease, PTSD, pain, and even cancer. It's time the art of healthcare embraced cannabis in all of its forms. Speaking of art, my guest this week, Art Chantry, artist and graphic designer of music culture posters, logo art, and even several early Seattle Hemp Fest posters, is going to be right up. But first, I want to address a weekly component of the show, my word of the week. This week's word is bureaucracy, which means, in part, a system of government in which most of the important decisions are made by appointed state officials rather than elected representatives. 
The Seattle Hemp Fest has to negotiate a virtual ocean of bureaucracy annually in order to secure its various permits and use agreements needed to produce the massive pot festival. Bureaucracies have been criticized as being too complex, inefficient, or too inflexible. The dehumanizing effects of excessive bureaucracy even became a major theme in the work of Franz Kafka. The elimination of unnecessary bureaucracy is a key concept in modern managerial theory. Ah, we can dream, but there is no layer of bureaucratic micromanagement to overcome here on CannabisRadio.com. Let's break free from the chains of governments right now and delve into the grainy gray matter of poster art guru, Art Chantry. Art, welcome to Hemp Present on Cannabis Radio, my brother. Hey, how's it hanging? How's it hanging? So far, so good. Swinging low. Um, First of all, it's good to hear. I, I just want to start off, Art. You are an artist and your name is Art. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, is that weird, or well, what's the deal? Well, actually, I grew up with the nickname Skippy, so I was Skippy as a child, and then I became Art as I became a professional. So it's nice. a professional name. Nice. But it's actually my real name. Boy, that's complicated. It's, ta- it's complicated having several names. At least you've got just one, Vivian. I mean... So, so you don't only play an artist on TV, but you're the president as well? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I'm not, I'm taking the blame okay. for this ship going down. That's for sure. Um, okay. The buck yeah. stops here, here Art. <laughs> Art, your career spans five decades. It's your work has been exhibited in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Museum of Modern Art, Seattle Art Museum, the Smithsonian, the Louvre. Uh, in fact, there has even been a 19 – because of you, there's been a 1994 Hempfest poster in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How did you become an artist? What – got you involved in art? What's your early history? What inspired you? What started well, you this? Know, as a kid, that's how I got started. I used to collect comic books. I read monster magazines. I started collecting rock posters and all the early Fillmore and Avalon ballroom stuff when I was a kid. And I wanted to do that too. So I was actually getting, earning money. Instead of doing paper routes, I was earning money designing logos for kids in high school. So I was doing this before I was doing any other thing professionally. My first job was doing graphic design. I didn't even know what it was called. What year was that? Oh, geez. High school? That was probably in the late 60s, early 70s. I graduated from high school in 72. Okay. Just about four years I'm ahead probably, of me. I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably older than you. Not much. Not by much, Art. I'm catching up with you fast. I'm usually the oldest guy in the room. I'm... And the best looking art as well. I mean, let's let's oh, be this is, this is radio, you know, so we gotta tell I the just truth. I wish here. I still had some hair on my head. That's the only thing I miss. You know, I used to have beautiful hair. It's all gone now. So sad. We we did hear your beard scraping against the microphone, so we're getting some hair here. Yeah, well it's a balance thing. You know? <laughs> it's, you know, it's all about balance. It, I'm, I'm a Libra, that. so I agree. Speaking okay. of the film era, speaking of the Fillmore Ballroom, the Avalon Ballroom, those period back in the 1960s psychedelic scene of San Francisco, there were many prolific artists, you know, like Stanley Mouse, Alton Kelly, Wes Wilson, Rick Griffin, to name only a few. Yeah. Who are some other artists from the punk and or grunge rock scenes that you might admire, if any? When I started out, I really admired all the same guys you just listed, and you know, one of the things about getting older and staying doing this stuff for so long is I've had an opportunity to meet all those guys. I never met Rick Griffin. He was dead before I got the chance, but I've had a chance to meet and hang out with a lot of those people. I know I've seen a photo of you with Stanley Mouse, you know, and it's always a surprise to meet these guys because they're really, really nice guys. They've got nothing to prove anymore and they've already been there and they've already done it. And so they're just totally cool people. Um, well, you know, when you met Stanley Mouse, what did you think? I thought he was surprisingly quiet and humble and almost timid. Yes. He was really very, very shy. Who would have thunk? Yeah, no kidding. You look at that poster work and stuff, and you just think he's probably the life of the party. No, no, he's one of those kind of guys who is kind of a nerdy cartoon guy with, you know, tape on his glasses and zits when he was a kid drawing monsters and hot rods, just like you or me, you know. And he started doing this stuff and, you know, he started hanging out with a different crowd, doing these posters. And, you know, now we just assume he was a wild and crazy guy. Now he's a really shy, laid back, very, very quiet, humble guy, you know, just a sweetie. Have you met, just out of curiosity, have you met Art Crumb? He's kind of one of the weirder, seems kind of one of the odd. I've met him once. 
I met him once in a in kind of a very busy context, and I went up and I started talking to him, and then his wife Aileen jumped in and took over the conversation and pulled me away from him. <laughs> I was just some crazy guy, annoying poor Robert Crumb, who just wanted to be left alone. <laughs> the poor guy. I mean, can you imagine what it must be like being him? My God, you know, everybody no. must come up and try and talk to him. Yeah, I can't imagine being inside his head, really. Oh yeah, it must be a massively wild place inside of his head. <laughs> All those synapses flashing in directions you can't even expect, man. It's with, just with must- really cool single line shading, right? Yeah, and a lot of a lot of cross hatching. He does this really, really crude. You ever seen him? Well, you've seen that movie Crumb about him. Yeah, he's a scribbler. He's the kind of guy who's always drawing something. He draws on napkins. He draws on magazines. He's just so he's got a pen. He talks to you, and he's drawing while he talks. And one of the cool things about looking at R. Crumb's drawings is that there's no corrections. There's no underdrawing. It's just the drawing. Most people who draw, they first do a quick line drawing. There is called the cartoon in the old days, but it's a, it's a pencil sketch. And then they come in and they draw all the ink line over the top of that pencil sketch. And then they come in with white out and correct the parts they don't like and redraw that. Crumb, it just comes out of his pen first time, every time, that's it. And it's always perfect. I've only met about three or four people who are like that. Uh, Henry Hernandez, who, one of the guys in the Love and Rockets comics, he's like that. He's the kind of guy who sits down with a repeatograph pen, puts it on the paper, cracks open a beer, turns on a game or something, and just starts letting his pen draw pictures. And he just now watches the game while his hands draw these pictures. It's an amazing thing to see some people have, you know. Art, I grew up on Zap Comics and Mother yep. Oat and Yellow Dog and all those crazy old comics. You know, Dave Sheridan was one of my favorite. Leather Nun, he yeah. did Leather Nun comics. Um, are there yeah. are there any contemporary graphic artists who excite you or think is interesting or takes a, taking a different approach? Anything you see well, these you, days? There's there's an awful lot of interesting stuff going on out there, but it's kind of bubbling around down in the underground again. The mainstream is, as usual, kind of gone on its own merry way and left everything behind. There's a whole scene that emerged about 10 years ago of gig poster artists. And it kind of centered around a website called gigposters.com. And it started off as a place for people who are into rock posters and gig posters just hang out and talk about stuff and show their stuff to each other. And it exploded. And before you knew it, there was like 10,000 names of people hanging out there, all of them trying to do gig posters on their own too. And all of a sudden there was like how, where there used to be a couple hundred guys doing rock posters in America. I mean, you could literally know every single one of them as a friend, you know. And then, like, within a year or two, there was, like, 10,000 people doing gig posters. And there's just billions of gig posters coming out. And what was interesting for me as a professional designer was that that became the new home for American illustration. Professional illustrators used to have magazines or record covers or, you know, uh, ma- newspapers to do their illustration work for and make a living. The only place left for new American illustration was gig posters for a few years there. So some incredible, incredible artists have come out of that scene. Well, there's one guy named Jay Ryan who's like one of my heroes, even though he's you know way younger than me. Check out Jay Ryan's work, R-Y-A-N. He's just an absolutely incredible, and he's another one of those guys that puts his pen down on the piece of paper and the drawing comes out. I've watched him draw. It's absolutely a beautiful thing to watch him do. You know, there's a special kind of person that can work like that, and he's one of them. We are talking to Seattle poster guru Art Chantry on Cannabis Radio on the Hemp Present Show. We're going to take a quick pause for the cause because there's flaws in the laws and be right back with Art Chantry. Time to roll out for the people that let us hemp present. Hang loose. We're coming right back. InternetMarketingNinjas.com is the online dojo of the highly trained and skilled Internet Marketing Ninjas. Disavow documents, reconsideration requests, Panda and Penguin penalties. Let our superior SEO ninjas confront all of your link-related issues. The Internet Marketing Ninjas are equipped to master any marketing exercise, content creation, authorship, link building, PPC, and more. Plus, build more buzz for your brand with our social media marketing strategy. Discover all that the Internet Marketing Ninjas can do for you. Visit the online dojo now at internetmarketingninjas.com. 
your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis plans for owners just like you to ensure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R spells out their full service insurance services, ranging from commercial to bonds to personal, from life to health, and more. Contact the team at KarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. Doc Rob, the concierge for better living. Cannabis is just one of the many great plants that we have on this planet called Earth that we can use consciously and intelligently to improve our well-being. Take a real, raw, inside look at healthier living while sharing great ideas and improvements for a better quality of life. Learning to live and live well is a lifelong process. This is a journey. It could be you could be 80 years old or 8 years old. You can still learn something that's going to make tomorrow a little bit healthier, a little bit easier, a little bit happier, a little bit better. The Concierge for Better Living with Doc Rob. Only on CannabisRadio.com. We're back to Hemp Presents, only on Cannabis Radio. Now, back to our headstrong emperor of hemp, Vivian McPeak. And we're back on Hemp Present on Cannabis Radio with Art Chantry. So, Art, uh, if I'm correct, you generally don't work on a computer, instead using more organic methods such as exacto knives, copiers, photo set, at least in the initial uh, f- stages of design. How do you feel about the mass proliferation of digital art? Does it even have an artistic soul? Is there a ghost in the machine or a uh, zombie in the zeitgeist? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's my only answer. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm an old guy. I learned doing this stuff the way I learned to do it, and that is my art form. That is my canvas and, and brush and pigment. So I still work the old way doing paste up and taking exacto knives and, and a waxer and I use pens and ink and paper and stuff like that. And that's, I love doing that. That's my Zen. I sit down and I'm working on that stuff. I trance. It's, it's a wonderful experience and I'm not giving that up. You know, the entire printing process has become digital. So I can't really process my work the old way. It has to go through a digital interface, which means it all has to get scanned and worked on by somebody who sits there and takes my artwork and changes it. You know, one of the worst things I run into is that most of the people out there are not trained in the old way, so they see my artwork, and they start taking it, and they fix it. You know, like, well, I might have something that looks like... Yeah, I have something that just looks like crap, you know, and I do it intentionally because I want it to actually get reproduced that way. They will clean it all up so it looks all clean and tidy <laughs> looking. And it just drives me nuts. And there's almost nothing you can do about it because you don't, you never even meet these guys. You know, they're just out there in the interface somewhere. The idea of the ghost in the machine, that's, that's my version of the ghost in the machine is having to like run my artwork through people. I have no idea who they are. And they've got the power of life and death over what my stuff turns out like. And I can't control that, you know. And so I have, like, I have to try and make my design work bomb-proof so that anybody can get their hands on it and screw it up this far that way or this far that way and still have it come out okay. That becomes an art form in itself, I'll tell you that. But no, I really, I mean, obviously computers can do anything and anybody can buy a computer, therefore... My competition is everybody. It's turned into a DIY world. You know, we're all just trying to survive. Yeah. I Nobody agree. needs to hire a professional anymore. You know, they don't need to hire me. So all the work uh, that I've promoted and really pushed and tried to show everybody else how to do that whole DIY style worked. They don't need me anymore. I worked myself <laughs> out of a job. And there's a beauty to that, too. I mean, I'm fine. I'll always do fine. I can survive anything. But, you know, to to actually see all that kind of crappy DIY punk rock style and effort that, you know, any level of sophistication or talent was perfectly acceptable, all of a sudden, it's really true because anybody can buy a computer and turn out professional pre-pressed graphics 
out of it. And you don't need to know what you're doing to make it look great. <laughs> so I'm gone. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I've been retired. I don't know about you, but I used to spend many hours at Midnight Kinko's back in the early 90s uh, with a, a glue pen in my hand and an X-Acto knife yeah. and the other one going crazy. I had my own drawing people by that point. <laughs> I sure knew all the copiers in the neighborhood. And, you know, I actually used to, I never owned a copier myself because I wanted to have all the, every copier has its own kind of personality. And you, us old guys right. know what I'm talking about. And it's, right. it also depends on their maintenance cycle, whether they've been like cleaned <laughs> lately or something like that. And as the, every machine kind of goes through its cycle, it does different things and you get to know what these machines can do. So I would find myself running around the neighborhood to the different office supply stores and 7-Elevens and dumping quarters and nickels into these things because I knew this one was going to do this. If I copied it too many times on this machine, it will turn into a stipple pattern, you know, whereas this one will kind of gray out and turn into just a big dirty mess. And if you take those two and fit them together, you got something you can work with. Well, Art, you are as lovably cynical and jaded as you would expect an artist who worked in the punk, post-punk, and grunge rock era to be. You designed Thank posters. You. Thank and, you. And you're, you're welcome. It's just an astute observation of mine. You designed yeah, posters and album covers for bands from the Pacific Northwest and beyond, such as Nirvana, Hole, The Sonics, Mud Honey, and so many more. What do you think of the current music scene? Are there any bands or current performers that you like at all? What do you listen to? Well, I actually, I to begin with, I've stopped listening to new music a long time ago. It's just like it comes. Everybody in their life comes to a point where they just kind of stop buying records. They just can't anymore. And I hit that in the early aughts. So I listen to old music. I go to thrift stores and buy 45s that buy people I've never heard of and just listen to them to see what they sound like. Listen to like worlds from another planet kind of thing. But also, I don't live in Seattle anymore. I live in Tacoma. And Tacoma has its own little scene, always has had. And it's always been a very tough music scene. You think of the Whalers, you think of the Sonics, you know, Heart Matured down here, Nirvana was a Tacoma band, no matter what you think. They may have come from Aberdeen, and they may have gotten famous in Seattle, but in between, they lived in Tacoma. And a lot of their rough sound came from this living in this town. So there's a very, it's a really rough and tumble kind of rock and roll scene. It's a great old rock town. And that is the music scene I'm kind of paying attention to right now. And I got to tell you, it's great. There's great music down here, and nobody in Seattle will ever listen to it because it's in Tacoma. They're afraid to even come down here. They think they'll get shot. You know, they think the people down here will eat them. And you know what? It's true. <laughs> Seattle people coming down here will be eaten. So that's all there is to it. You have a couple books out. Some people can't surf. The graphic designer Art Chantry and Art Chantry. Oh, Speaks. that's a print now. That's an old book. That's an old a heretic's book. history of that's... 20th century graphic design. Can you talk about those two bodies of work real quick? Yeah. Well, the first book you mentioned is out of print. That's like a, a monograph about my. That makes work. it good. Well, now it's collectible. You know, collectible is always good. The current book, the second one you mentioned, is called Art Chantry Speaks. It's out on Feral House Press. And it just came out, oh, a couple weeks ago. And that's a book that is basically me mouthing off about all the stuff I care about. It started off life as something that I was just doing for fun on Facebook, where I'd sit down and find something laying around my garbage dump of a studio and say, hey, that's cool. And I'd scan it and I'd post it and then I'd write something about it. Like, why is this cool? Well, this is why it's cool. And after about 2,000 of those, I learned how to write pretty well. And a publisher approached me and says, let's do a compilation. And that's what this book is, is a collection of a selection, not even the best of. It's just a selection of these little essays as they turned out about stuff I'm interested in. It might be a T-square, it might be an old record cover, it might be a poster, it might be a can of beer. I don't know. It's just whatever I thought was interesting at the moment. And I just basically tell what I know about it. And it turns out I got a lot of stuff in my head. So that's what this book is, is a collection of stuff that was rattling around in my head. I was able to make it fall out my fingertips. All right, you started doing art for the Seattle Hemp Fest in, I think, 94. Starting 94 with was the first one. Family. Yeah, me and Jamie Sheehan uh, did that stuff together. Remember that? Yep, yep. Starting with a famed cigarette pack poster promoting the Seven Year Bitch's performance. I think you worked for yeah, Memphis, I, at least through '98. Uh, did, what did you ever think when you started working? No, we, did we, you think it become what it is today? We did nine years. We did nine years of Hempfest posters. 
That's we right. We did them from 94 until 2003 or four. Something like that. Maybe yeah, actually, later. 2004 yeah. at least because of the donkey poster. So you're right. At least at least eight years. Maybe so that was at least ten that's years. Ten years we did. You know that was ten really important years. Jamie and I did the t-shirts and the, the posters. The Save Him Fest, and, Crocodile Cafe. I can think of so many. Oh cool. yeah, we did promotion posters, things like that, and you know that was good times. That was really fun stuff. You know, you guys were a, gl- a really great client to have because you were just. Because you know, we you, didn't pay anything. <laughs> yeah, well, there were, no, you paid some. I mean, it some. wasn't a total freebie. No, but uh, you guys were to open to what we had to present. Most clients want to stick their fingers in the pie and design it themselves and use your hands as their computer. You guys respected us, and that was a good thing. It allowed us to really flex and try a few things. You know, there were a couple times it didn't work very well, but, geez, some of them turned out nice. Boy, that was some good stuff. Working on Hempfest is one of those annual anticipation things. Oh, boy, when's this going to start? Well, we got a couple more in the pipeline coming down, looking at our 25th anniversary. How is that even possible? 25 years. I, still I don't know. I, I look in the mirror and I say, who is that old man and why does he keep impersonating me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you, no, I, I don't want to get into one of those. Remember the good old day moments, but can you remember yes. how completely different like 94 was? That was the first year that they moved out of Volunteer Park and went into Gasworks, and that's when it kind of like everything hit the fan and it became huge. That was yep. a very weird moment to watch, you know? Yep, it absolutely. went from a few hundred to 10, 20,000. Wow. That was the year that it really busted out. I know that people couldn't get home to their houses in Wallingford for hours because it was a total cluster. Yeah. We're going to take another quick break. We're back with the last questions for Art Chantry and a wrap of our show here on Hemp Present on Cannabis Radio. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Time to roll out for the people that let us Hemp Present. Hang loose. We're coming right back. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nestle trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. From high atop Mount Soldad in San Diego, California, 100 feet above sea level. Good morning. It's good news with cannabis nurse Heather. This plant is amazing. Positive change is happening. We did it. No matter who you are, you can make a positive impact on the world. I would rather be illegally alive than legally dead. And that quote helped to give you strength. Nurse Heather is only on CannabisRadio.com. Good morning, Cannabis Nurse Heather. We're back to Hemp Presents, only on Cannabis Radio. Now, back to our headstrong emperor of hemp, Vivian McPeak. And we are back on Hemp Present on the Cannabis Radio Network with Seattle poster guru Art Chantry. Art, many musicians and artists over the years have used pot and other substances uh, for inspiration and reflection. Uh, now, that it's, <laughs> now that it's legal, I think it's okay to ask you, have you done the same? Are you straight edge when it comes to your work or have you been experienced? <laughs> well, I've definitely been experienced. I've been around the block a few times. You know, I really don't smoke pot anymore. I'm an alcoholic. I had real problems with addiction in there. So I basically have steered myself away from all of that sort of thing. And I, I my stimulation, I listen to music a lot now when I work instead of get high. And for me, it works just fine. You know, it's there's no loss of creativity in the process and stuff. So, But when an artist looks for that creative urge, that, that little spark, we try everything sooner or later. Do everything from 
exercising too much to all kinds of overstimulation to any drug you can imagine just to find that creative thing. But then, you know, begin to realize it starts coming out of you automatically just through experience. Yeah. So you use the hemp as far as hemp paper and things like that? Have you used that application? Well, I'm a graphic designer, so sooner or later my stuff gets printed on a piece of paper, you know, and that's kind of a pet peeve of mine because the paper industry just gets more and more expensive every year. The cost of paper goes up and up and up and up, and it's all acid-filled paper because they're using just wood fiber and wood pulp, and it yellows and it rots and it disintegrates. So my artwork is printed on stuff that self-destructs. It's, it's, it's depressing, you know, and also it's damned expensive. Now, if we could just go back to using hemp paper like we did when this country was first founded, all the founding fathers were hemp farmers, it seems, and they all smoked pot. It's really interesting to go back and you can find it written in their own handwriting, how much they love to relax in the the evening with a bowl of hemp, you know, and George Washington, Ben Franklin, even Abe Lincoln, it's ridiculous, you know, Um, but the paper that newspapers in 1776 were printed on still look brand new today, if you can even imagine. It's ridiculous. Hemp paper has no acid in it. And so why don't we go back to making paper that survives a little longer? You can get several crops a season out of one acre of hemp, but you get the same amount of pulp out of five acres of wood pulp and we can get several crops a season out of it, you know, with the hemp. It would be far cheaper, far better, archival museum-grade paper that we could actually recycle because the hemp fibers are stronger and longer and more resilient. You could recycle it endlessly. Wood pulp, you can only recycle once or twice, and the fibers break down into a mush that you can't print on anymore. I really, this whole legalization process of hemp, Everybody focuses on the medicinal and the recreational and all of that. Me, I love industrial hemp, man. I want to see this stuff enter our industrial force again, just like it used to be. I mean, we had it going strong until World War II. That's when DuPont stepped in and a lot of those other outfits and kind of got it legal, uh, banned and made it illegal. And when that went, so did all the hemp paper. Nowadays, we're starting to use more hemp paper, and it's leaking very slowly back into the the printing process. But still, there's so many restrictions on it. You know, start lifting the restrictions, and we can start using that stuff like we're we're meant to use it. You know, it gets you're, you're talking so my language. You're talking my well, language, yeah. Art. You're in the right place Absolutely. for that space. Because we are definitely an imbiber of the fiber here on Hempresent. I want to thank you, old friend Art Chantry, author, art icon, for being on Hempresent on Cannabis Radio. And thanks for tremendously essential and important body of work. You're a legend, and it's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very sweet. Okay. And you're a legend, too, Viv. Never sell yourself short. You're kind of a sweetie. You bet, my brother. Thanks so much for being on the show. Take care of yourself. Now I want to get to another uh, weekly feature on Hemp Present on CannabisRito.com, and that's the quote of the week. And this quote goes like this. We have no alternative but to protest. For many years we have shown an amazing patience, but we come here tonight to be saved from that patience that makes us patient with anything less than the freedom and justice. And that's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Montgomery, Alabama, December 5th, 1955. I think that pretty much says it all, uh, and that is that he wants to be saved from that patience that makes us patient with anything less than freedom and justice. And that was a man that really walked his talk, which is something we're trying to do here, and that concludes this installment of Hempresent on Cannabis Radio. Join me next week for my guest, Portland, Oregon-based Doug McVeigh, editor of Drug War Facts and Common Sense for Drug Policy, because when it comes to prohibition, you have the right not to remain silent. Activism requires a voice to speak up for justice. Thanks, we'll see you next week. We got to free the weed. Take back the plant. We got to plant.